A lot of this will be history. Um, there'll be some some comments about uh, uh, re recent results, and some of which I even have something to do with. Um, um, but uh, like all the other speakers, I, I want to uh, uh, wish Anton happy birthday some some months late or some months early, uh, and I I. I I'm not sure when we first met, but uh, you know, it must have been possibly. Yeah, I, I had a list of other places. I didn't include Tucson, but that, that that's conceivable. Um, but but I remember spending uh, some very pleasant times in Berlin, for example. Okay. Um, oh yes, and let me apologize. There are a few people who have heard basically this talk not so many months ago. Uh, Too many birthdays. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, so this is uh, uh, a, a very classical topic, the Riemann hypothesis. Uh, what the point of view that uh, will be taken here has to do with uh, the relation between the Riemann hypothesis and uh, Laplace transforms of certain functions on the real line. Uh, so, uh, for, so for a function f, and, and the functions we'll deal with will all be non-negative functions that are integrable over the whole real line, uh, we look at a one-parameter family of Laplace transforms. So uh, you can begin with taking this little lambda to be zero, then it's just the, the two-sided Laplace transform of the function f. Um, uh, depending on w how f decreases at plus and minus infinity, um, uh, and what the lambda is, uh, then uh, this, uh, this thing will be defined for uh, can be defined for complex W. For example, e with no with no assumptions beyond this integrability, if you take lambda to be negative, then the then the function that you're taking Laplace transform of e to the lambda u squared f of u uh, decreases uh, sufficiently rapidly at plus and minus infinity, so that uh, this uh, Laplace transform will be an entire function. Of, co of a complex W in, in the complex plane. And so uh, depending on what the function f is, uh, we'll define this uh, for whichever values of lambda uh, are possible. For some functions of f which decrease rapidly uh, enough at infinity, even when you make lambda positive, this will still decrease at infinity, and then, uh, uh, then this uh, this, for, this Laplace transform will be a nice entire function of W uh, uh, for each real lambda. Um, and then sometimes we'll want to think of, uh, uh, since the, the f will be positive and integrable, if you multiply by a constant, you could think of it as a probability density. And then this would be the uh, um, Laplace transform or moment generating function of the, well, of lambda, little lambda zero of the probability measure rho, and if lambda is non-zero, then, well, maybe that e to the lambda u squared d rho is no longer normalized, but uh, except for that, which is relatively minor, uh, this would be a moment generating function, really of a one parameter family of measures parameterized by this parameter lambda. Okay, so that's the sort of general setup. Uh, the reason we're interested in this is that there's a particular choice of f uh, so that when lambda is zero, this is directly related to the Riemann hypothesis, and when lambda is non-zero, it's a kind of perturbed, uh, related to a sort of perturbed version of the Riemann hypothesis. Okay, so here's the, the specific function. Uh, uh, this is a specific function 
little f that I mentioned before I called capital phi. And when that little lambda is zero, so you don't you just take the Laplace transform of that function phi, uh, the zeros in the complex plane of that Laplace transform or moment generating function of the variable complex variable w uh, are related to the Riemann hypothesis simply by the statement that the Riemann hypothesis is equivalent to the zeros of that Laplace transform with the little lambda being zero, being all pure imaginary. So uh, the real, th that's because this, this Laplace transform, I'll, I'll use the, the terminology, when that's true, all the zeros are pure imaginary. I'll say the, 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 uh, that Laplace transform is, has the PIZ property, pure imaginary zeros property. Uh, the, the phi is, uh, and, and this goes back to Riemann himself, the phi is, uh, is defined so that this Laplace transform is related to Riemann's zeta function, which is here, uh, uh, in a fairly uh, simple way. You multiply it by a gamma function, you multiply it by some uh, exponential of s with a pi coming in in a funny way, you multiply it by s and s minus one. Uh, this, this, this quantity here is the Riemann xi function, uh, and these, uh, th this multiplication ha have several effects. There's a, uh, the, the zeta function has a pole at s equals one. Uh, the series diverges there. Uh, the gamma function has a zero, uh, no, sorry, th th this has a zero there, that s minus one, which kills that pole. Uh, the gamma function has poles which kill the so-called trivial zeros of the zeta function along the negative real axis. Uh, I think there's that the gamma function introduces another pole which is killed by this s. And the pi to the minus s over two uh, is there to sort of symmetrize things. We'll, we'll see the symmetry property in a moment. And then you also change variables. The, the, the famous critical strip in the variable s is a real s between zero and one. And we've now uh, shifted things by, uh, um, uh, so that what used to be the critical line at real s equals one half is now the pure imaginary axis. Okay, and this function phi, whose Laplace transform we're interested in, has an explicit formula, and here it is. Uh, it's related to the theta function and changes of variables and things of that sort. It's a little weird looking uh, the first five or six times that you see it, but, uh, but it's, it's, it's a definite function on the real line. This clearly is convergent for any real u because for any real u, this factor here is going to zero very rapidly. Uh, and so these n to the fourth, n to the squared, don't, no matter, it's convergent. Uh, so that defines a function for all real u. Let me write down uh, on the board a few properties of this function. I'm going to show you a graph of it in a moment. The graph is, is uh, spectacularly boring. Uh, well, in fact, let me show you the graph, then I'll write down the, some, some properties. There's a graph of the function. Uh, this, this is height zero. Uh, and now, now let me go back and uh, write down a few things, which, uh, which then we'll go back to the graph. Um, okay, here, here are some properties. I can read my notes. Oh, yes. So there's one property which is, uh, not at all obvious. Uh, usually it's stated in terms of the zeta function. It's called Riemann's functional equation for the zeta function. It's a relationship between zeta at s and at one minus s. But because we change variables, it simply uh, uh, changes into the fact that this function phi is even. That's not at all obvious. That's not obvious in the formula. It's not at all obvious in the formula, correct. 
it, it comes from some identity from the theta function. It's a it's an extremely classic uh, classic fact that can be derived in various ways. Uh, um, uh, and, and, and as I say, the, in the, when you write it in terms of the zeta function, that's called a, a Riemann's functional equation. Uh, but it certainly is not obvious. Um, okay, so another property, uh, which is half obvious, is that uh, this function is rapidly decreasing at infinity uh, as you go to infinity. Uh, something like a constant e to minus another constant uh, e to the 4u. So for, for large, large positive u, that's uh, obvious from this term here. This is the dominant behavior for large u. Uh, uh, that goes to zero very rapidly. These are minor, minor corrections. Um, uh, you have the exponential of 4u or 4 absolute values? Thank you. Yes. So, so I, so I say that 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 I said it's half obvious because it's a kind of obvious when u goes to plus infinity from this formula. It's not at all obvious for you going to minus infinity. However, if that follows from the, the symmetry, <laughs> uh, there's a similar effect. Uh, which is less, less remarked on in the uh, number theory literature because it's only the kind of things somebody in probability would sort of bother to observe, that this function is non-negative. So here's a proof. Uh, for u greater than or equal to 0, you can just check that these prefactors are term by term greater than or equal to 0. Um, that's not the case when u is negative. However, you don't have to worry about that because of uh, property 1. OK, now, now, let's, now let's go back to the, the picture. And uh, you can see that uh, 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 this is numerically confirmed, <laughs> the, these properties. That certainly looks like an even function of u. It it goes to zero, um, goes to zero extremely rapidly. This is zero after u is bigger than about I don't know 0.4. So you can hardly tell the difference between uh, phi of u and zero. Uh, and and uh, it also looks positive if uh, once you believe that this this is zero over there. Uh, so. Uh, OK. Well, why do you care about this function? Well, because if you could prove something about its, its uh, Laplace transform or uh, multiply, multiplying by a constant would make this a probability density. And then the, that's the Laplace transform is the, is the moment generating function. Uh, that, that, would, uh, that, that is equivalent to the Riemann hypothesis. OK, so now I want to talk about some history. Um, so uh, I believe it's the case that th this idea of uh, sort of perturbing, so, the, so it's, I think it's already in, in Riemann's original paper, uh, a look, looking at this uh, Laplace transform when little lambda is 0. That's the sort of unperturbed version. That's the, uh, that is the Riemann hypothesis. Uh, I think it was Polya's idea to put in this extra Gaussian perturbative factor, the e to the lambda u squared. And then uh, he had the idea that perhaps it might be true that you had the pure imaginary zeros property, not just for lambda equals 0, which was the one you're really interested in, but for all real lambda. Uh, he showed that uh, uh, this, and this is, uh, this is sort of an important uh, feature. Uh, he showed that in uh, uh, putting in this perturbative factor, the, uh, the more positive uh, or less negative you make lambda, the better as far as the pure imaginary zeros property. So if you have that property for some value lambda 1, then you will have it for any lambda uh, bigger than lambda 1. Uh, 
so you should, once you think of that as, as thinking that in, increasing lambda along the real line uh, sort of helps the pure energy zeros property, or at least it doesn't hurt it, whereas uh, making it negative may, may hurt it. Okay, the, the, next, uh, the next major uh, uh, chapter in, 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 in the history uh, is, uh, uh, happens uh, in the 1950 paper of uh, Nicolas de Bruyne, and I apologize to the Dutch speakers here for my bad pronunciation. Uh, um, uh, he showed that be basically, be you already know that the zeros uh, are in the critical strip, um, which has just been shifted to being uh, uh, symmetric about the imaginary axis. A and not only does in uh, uh, Polya show that uh, making lambda making lambda more positive uh, does not does not hurt or might help. Uh, De Bruyne showed that it really does help, and using the fact that the zeros were already in the critical strip, uh, he showed that if you help them enough, namely by making the lambda at least one half, that will, uh, any zeros which w weren't on the, uh, may not have been on the critical line to start with on the imaginary axis, but they couldn't be too far away because they're in the critical strip, they will be on the critical line uh, by the time lambda gets to be one half. So that, that's, uh, that's, that's De Bruyne's uh, result. Uh, then I had a paper uh, in, uh, so th you know, th this, this is, m most of its history, uh, the Riemann hypothesis has moved not, you know, uh, made pro things that have been progress of all sorts, but you know, every 20 or 30 years. Uh, anyway, then 25 or so years after that, uh, I did a paper, which uh, if we don't run out of time, I'll, I'll tell a little bit about the motivation, which actually came from a lattice Euclidean field theory. Uh, uh, but at some point I realized that the thing I was doing said something about this uh, poly of perturbed version of the real hypothesis. And uh, basically what I, what I proved was that uh, polya's uh, hope uh, is, isn't valid. It, this cannot be true for all real lambda, if you make lambda sufficiently negative, there's some sufficiently negative value of lambda so that the zeros are not all pure imaginary once, once you've heard it enough, once you've perturbed it in the sort of wrong direction. Uh, so so by, by Polya's result, uh, you have this sort of kind of monotonicity of the pure imaginary zeros property in little lambda. So, uh, so now you know that there's, as you vary a little lambda, there's some place where you make a kind of transition from not having the pure imaginary zeros property to having it. That, so that's a number <laughs> called uh, the no capital lambda. It's the kind of critical value of little lambda where the pure imaginary zeros property changes from not being, not being valid to being valid. Uh, it's strictly a finite, greater, strictly greater than minus infinity. That was, that was my result. And then it's, it's less than or equal to one half. That follows from De Bruyne's result. Uh, so this constant uh, is now called the De Bruyne Newman constant after these two papers. Uh, and the Riemann hypothesis is simply the statement that that constant is less than or equal to zero. Uh, if it's l strictly less than zero, it means that even if you perturb uh, the Riemann hypothesis statement in the kind of the bad direction uh, a little bit, it will still be true. If it's equal to zero, it means it's true, but the bad perturbation will hurt it, or change it, yes? Would it be possible with these results that actually capital lambda is never reached exactly, but it's the, it's the lower bound? For the region, but it's no, no, no. It, it, it's at at the at the value. If you take little lambda to be equal to capital lambda, then you do have the pure imaginary zeros property. That's sim simply by sort of continuity of zeros in the complex plane. So it would be sufficient to prove that capital lambda is zero. Well, uh, uh, as we'll see as we go to some more of the story uh, by by this date. 
that, that now is known to be equivalent to the Riemann hypothesis. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to I'm going to kind of uh, review some of the things I just said in a, uh, in the next slide. So here's uh, just sort of re restating uh, these things. So uh, the Bruyne's result is that this constant is strictly less than or equal to one half. I proved it's strictly greater than minus infinity because there's some place where the pure imaginary zeros property stopped and in that same paper, I made the conjecture uh, uh, that, uh, as I said, that, uh, the Riemann hypothesis is, is equivalent to the statement that, that capital lambda is less than or equal to zero. I made the sort of complementary conjecture that it's greater than or equal to zero, which means that uh, if you perturb it even by a little bit in the sort of wrong direction, uh, you, you, you won't, you, you'll stop having a pure managing zeros property. And I, th I think I have wrote there the statement that if it's, this means that if it's true, it's only barely, barely so. Okay, then uh, from a personal point of view, so I, I, I may mention later a little about the background for this. From my point of view, it had to do with Euclidean field theory models. And every 15 years or so, I would think a little bit about the Riemann hypothesis, but not, not, not very much. Uh, uh, so more recently, I discovered that you know other people had taken note of this paper, <laughs> and uh, you know uh, the the bound strictly greater than minus infinity doesn't sound like much, but it, you know it did show that there was a well-defined constant, uh, and then people started realizing they could get better bounds. The, the methods that, uh, that were used had to do with looking for. Uh, first numerically and then doing sort of computer-aided rigorous estimates, uh, looking for places on the critical line where there were zeros very close to each other. Basically because if you, if you want to, if you want to, if you start making the little m the negative and you want to get something where the zeros are not, not on the uh, imaginary axis by symmetry properties, the zeros have to move kind of together in pairs, so you have to have a close by pair of zeros come together uh, and then kind of go off to, uh, on either side into the complex plane. Uh, anyway, so there was a series of papers. These dots, I mean, not putting all the papers, there must have been a dozen or so, starting from 88 until fairly uh, more recently, in which the lower bounds improved uh, quite dramatically after a while. Uh, from uh, well, from minus strictly greater than minus infinity to minus fifty to minus ten to the minus six to minus ten to the minus eleventh. So of course, all of these are consistent with this conjecture, um, and we'll get to the m most recent results of that sort. Uh, as far as the upper bound, the this less than or equal to one half. Uh, until until very recently, the only improvement was uh, changing it from less than or equal to one half to strictly less than one half. Uh, that, that paper, Ki, Kim, and Lee, uh, about 10 years ago, uh, is, is uh, more significant than, than the, the improvement from less than or equal to less sounds like. They actually proved, for example, that uh, as soon as you make the little lambda even slightly positive, you don't know that the zeros are all pure imaginary, but they showed that at most, finitely many are not on the on, are not pure imaginary. So that, that's actually quite qualitatively significant, uh, and that's being used uh, very recently to uh, g uh, give well th th their their methods together with some of these others uh, to give better upper bounds. Okay, so now I want to continue with uh, with the, the history, uh, you know, from this series of bounds, and that's gets us to a much more recent thing, which is this year. Uh, so there's a paper posted about six months ago, uh, eight, seven months ago, January, by Brad Rogers and Terry Tao, uh, which actually proved that 76 conjecture. Uh, so, you know, so the, the, those increasingly better uh, uh, lower bounds getting very close to zero were not, not a fluke. Uh, they actually proved it. And uh, they used some, some of, uh, you know, they used the 
they use the uh, extended the methods that have been used in some of those papers about close pairs of zeros, uh, but did it, you know did things in a more serious and general way, in which you basically are looking at the motion of the zeros as you vary this parameter. Uh, well, now now we. I've changed lambda to little t. You think of it as time, so there's a kind of, uh, you can write down a differential equation for how the zeros move, and uh, uh, they, they, uh, they, they, they're kind of, they sort of uh, repel each other when they're on the imaginary axis. If they're off the imaginary axis, they sort of attract each other towards the imaginary axis. and. Uh, and they studied that uh, motion more seriously. They used ideas that come from uh, sort of random matrix theory and, uh, uh, and, and some known results about uh, the spacings of the zeros on the critical line or the, here the imaginary axis, uh, that they're not extremely evenly spaced, but if the if the uh, uh, if the if that uh, if the capital lambda were negative, it would mean you already would have the zeros on the imaginary axis, and now you kind of increase the t from a small negative value to zero. Those zeros are already on the imaginary axis; they would be attracting each other. When they're attracting each other, they're moving in the direction of being more evenly spaced and they would move enough in that direction that it would violate known, previously known results about how the spacings of the zeros. And, and you probably know that there's a long history of amazing numerical uh, results about how the spacings of the zeros of the zeta function look like the distribution of the Gaussian something, orthogonal ensemble, is it? Is that right? <laughs> Unitary, All right. one, one, one of those. <laughs> okay, uh, the, um, okay, uh, then, uh, then uh, so remember that the, for upper bounds, there was first le less, less than or equal to one half of De Bruyne, then there was strictly less than one half of Key, Kim, and Lee, and now uh, there's this, uh, you know, Terry Tao has this, these polymath projects where all kinds of people work together on problems, so he, he, uh, uh, some months ago, uh, he proposed, let's improve this upper bound by combining, uh, combining some of the ideas from the key, Kim and Lee, together with very serious numerical things, which, which you then make rigorous. And uh, so this, this, uh, this slide is a little bit out of date. Uh, as at the, current, the current status uh, is that they seem to have proved, improved the upper bound uh, below 0.28, I think, to 0 0.22, uh, that maybe they'll actually even write a paper, uh, uh, that group of people. Um, it's, it's, it, uh, th there's some wonderful lectures on the subject uh, that you can find on YouTube or someplace like that by Terry Tao. I highly recommend them, especially since in the more recent ones, he now is pronouncing my name properly. <laughs> He pronounced it as Neumann. <laughs> I, 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 I pointed, that, I po I pointed that, that out to him in an email, and he blamed it on his high school German teacher. No, but I, that used to be standard for me that in a, a papers written by Italian mathematical physicists, they would usually add an extra N for some reason. <laughs> Okay, uh, Okay. So, so here's a little bit, how, how much time do I have? 20 minutes. Really? Yeah. Well, you, actually, it's really a misspelling. It's a double U should be a U, and the N should be a double N. Yeah, and he should have a one. Should be one. <laughs> okay, I, I, <laughs> you know, I attempted to recount the old joke about the, the question whose answer is 9W. <laughs> For those of you who don't know it, we can discuss it that when we have the aperitif. <laughs> uh, 
uh, okay, so uh, so let me let's see. Yes, okay. So let me let me talk a little bit about the mathematical physics background. Um, well, so uh, of, of course, uh, so so questions of this sort are uh, some some sense originate with the theorem of uh, Lee and Young, uh, which uh, says that certain certain Ising model partition functions. Uh, well, if you use the right kinds of variables, have only pure imaginary zeros. Um, uh, and uh, that property is very useful for various, uh, various uh, things. And, uh, and since uh, lattice Euclidean field theories are kind of like easing models, uh, generalizations of easing models, in which you replace the point measure on plus one or minus one, for example, by uh, a measure with uh, a density like e to the minus some v, um, then you would like to have a Liang property in that case, not just for spin one half easing models. Um, and uh, there's there's one particular v where you're allowed to perturb it by this, this lamb, Gaussian lambda factor, which is also natural in, in Euclidean field theory. That's a mass term, mass term in, the, in the Lagrangian or Hamiltonian. Uh, so this is, I, I apologize for this uh, notation, uh, I mean this language. I started doing it uh, some, some talk or other. Uh, so I, 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 I called a, uh, a I, I'm calling a function f so that you can perturb it with any lambda, like like Polya hoped would be true for the ca function capital phi, but it's not true. Call such an f a perfect function. It's a very very bad term, and I apologize for it. Uh, anyway, but but there is one such which is very famous in uh, in uh, uh, in, you know, in five of the fourth quantum field theories. It's a five of the fourth quantum field theories. The, the function that you get there looks looks like this: e to the minus the constant, positive constant u to the fourth. And in that case, you can you you can perturb it with that lambda because it doesn't matter if any quadratic term be positive or negative. That still is uh, still has this pure imaginary zeros property. So that was proved in the in the. Uh, Euclidean field theory, statistical mechanics literature, in a paper of uh, uh, Barry Simon and Bob Griffiths in 1973, but it was actually known by Polya back in the 1920s, not not for the same purposes. He wasn't interested in five of the fourth field theories, but he was interested in the Riemann hypothesis, and he was looking for functions which which uh, you know, were perfect in this terminology, and and you can you can do this without using you know, easing model uh, spin one half easing model approximations like Simon and Griffiths did, uh, sort of much more directly, and, and Paul, you did, did do that. So that's an example. And uh, my interest at the time was, well, I was interested in, in other kinds of field theories besides phi the fourth, like exponential interaction, like a hyperbolic cosine. Uh, and I sort of wondered whether that also you could put in the arbitrary mass term with ar arbitrary sign for the B and still have the property. And that's what I was trying to figure out. And I figured it out by basically uh, characterizing all perfect Fs. Uh, and it did not include the hyperbolic cosine, so that was a disappointment at the time. Uh, it did not include the capital phi of the Riemann hypothesis. Well, that turned out to be positive in the sense that I could write a paper about the Riemann hypothesis, um, and that was that was the result. Which uh, I mean, the, that characterization and the fact that this capital phi is, doesn't belong to that class proved that if you made the little lambda especially negative, uh, you stopped having a pure imaginary zeros property. Uh, okay, so so here's some here's some uh, some recent related results uh, that I was involved in with uh, former postdoc Wei Wu, um, uh, and it's it, it's it's sort of in the spirit of these uh, uh, sorts of, of, of questions, uh, uh, you know, for for a given for a given say probability measure rho. Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, w w 
can you perturb it in the sort of bad direction and, ha and have the, the Leon, Leon uh, or the, sorry, the pre-regenerated zeros property uh, s still hold? Uh, and and here's, here's an example of one of our results. If this measure rho is n not like the thing that comes up in the, in the Riemann hypothesis, if, if suppose it's something which is a perfectly nice measure, but it's tailed behavior, how it goes to zero plus or minus infinity, uh, and, and we're always dealing with even measures, uh, and this, so you can take this as a probability measure, if it has a slower than Gaussian tail, so if you multiply it by a positive Gaussian factor with lambda positive, it's no longer integrable. So you're kind of on the border. Uh, if you put in a negative lambda, of course that's fine. Uh, but suppose it's some some it's a row which uh, you know is at the borderline. Uh, it, it, it just maybe it decay maybe its tail decays like e to the minus absolute u to the three halves. Uh, then then it would be like this, and then uh, we we showed that in that case any small perturbation. Whoops. Any small perturbation uh, uh, ruins the pure imaginary zeros property. So that's that's kind of, that's sort of like not as significant as the uh, Rogers Tau result, but it's sort of li like that. If you perturb it even a little bit uh, uh, in the bad direction, you don't have the pure imaginary zeros property. You you might have it when lambda equals zero, but you don't have it for any slightly negative lambda. So I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about our proof of that because the proof uses a, a kind of a, 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 a theorem that called theorem B here, which is a theorem about weak convergence of probability measures when you have the pure imaginary zeros property. Um, uh, and uh, I find that theorem, that, that theorem is in our paper, I find that theorem surprising. I didn't believe it in the beginning, but it turns out seems to be true, and it can be used to do things of this sort. Uh, there's a connection I'm not going to mention to what's called Gaussian multiplicative chaos, showing that certain, with a certain parameter range, you don't have the pure imaginary zeros property, even though there was some reason to think you maybe ought to, because the Gaussian multiplicative chaos, uh, that's an exponential of a, of a Gaussian free field, roughly, and uh, it somehow looks kind of like XY models, and XY models do have Leung type property and pure imaginary zeros property, but it turns out at least in certain parameter range, Gaussian multiplicative chaos does not. Anyway, here, here's, the, here's this theorem B. Um, so uh, let me state it and then say why I find it surprising. And then if I haven't run out of time, I can show how this theorem B implies that that theorem A. Um, so uh, we, we consider random variables really their distributions uh, in a certain class, which is has a, they have they have to have three properties. It's symmetric. It's an even even distribution. Um, it has at least Gaussian tails, so you can multiply by a, a strictly positive B. So th that example from theorem A is not in this class. Uh, and it has the pure imaginary zeros property of its moment generating function. So like the things that come up from easing models, pair of ferromagnetic easing models according to the theorem of Lee and Young. So, uh, so here's the theorem, uh, and let me, uh, it looks innocuous, and l let me tell you why I, think, I find it surprising. Suppose you have a sequence of random variables, or really their probability distributions, which satisfy these three properties even at least Gaussian fall off and pure imaginary zeros of the moment generating function. And that sequence of random variables converges in distribution in the standard, standard probabilistic sense. The Fourier transform converges pointwise, uh, ordinary convergence distribution. And now notice the following. Each xn is in z, so as far as this, this is a kind of uh, strong moment assumption. So it's uniform in n? It's absolutely not uniform in n. That's why this result is surprising. No assumption whatsoever. 
of uniformity. Just for each n, there is some b, which could get extremely small, however fast you want. Nevertheless, if, the, if you have convergence and distribution, the limiting variable is in this class, which means it has at least Gaussian fall off. It sounds completely unreasonable because one's used to, you know, if you want to get a limiting distribution which has a finite second moment, you better assume that the approximating things have finite two plus epsilon moment or something like that. This, this doesn't do that. Uh, however, hiding somewhere is the pure imaginary zeros property which somehow saves the day. <coughs> anyway, I, I find the, the result surprising. And uh, how much time do I have now? Just 10 minutes. Really? <laughs> I, I, I give a, I can give a second talk. <laughs> okay, so let, let me, so, uh, so, uh, okay, so, so let me explain how this the theorem implies that first theorem. The first theorem, we remember, was this. Uh, it said if you had a, a, a measure which had, uh, Think of a measure whose tail looks like e to the minus absolute u to the three halves power. So perfectly nice tail, its moment generating function is entire uh, analytic function. Uh, but if you perturb it, you can't perturb it with a positive Gaussian factor because its tail is, doesn't decrease fast enough. Then, then if you, you can perturb it in the, in the negative direction, because you're making the tail even better, but no matter how little you perturb it, it cannot have this pure imaginary zeros property. It might have it to start with when a little lambda is zero, but it can't have it when you perturb it a little more. So let me try to explain how that follows from theorem B. Okay. So, so it's proof by contradiction. Suppose, uh, suppose the conclusion was not valid. Suppose, suppose you could perturb it a little bit in the bad direction. You could take a slightly negative lambda zero, multiply the, the measure by that, and you had something, uh, well, you start with something even, and, and it's even better for the, for the uh, you, this would certainly have a Gaussian fall off because you're multiplying it by e to the mi negative constant u squared, but suppose it has the pure imaginary zeros property. Okay, we're trying to show that is not the case. Suppose it did for some lambda zero negative. Remember, Polya's result said once you have a lambda that works, bigger lambdas also work. So that would mean you could take any lambda strictly bigger than that negative value and you would have the pure imaginary zeros property, you would also have a Gaussian tail. The, 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 the rate of decay of the Gaussian tail would get small as this little lambda got close to zero, but you would have one for each, for each uh, lambda. Lambda is replacing little n now. Uh, so you would have this property. That, of course, that, so to look at lambda equals one over n. That sequence of measures, trivially converges uh, in distribution to rho because you're just multiplying by a, by a, a you know, Gaussian factor which is going to one. But then an application of theorem B would say that the limiting measure not only has the pure imaginary zeros property, but is in this class Z, meaning that it has to have Gaussian fall off. But it doesn't have Gaussian fall off because that was the assumption of theorem A. It had fall off like e to the minus x to the three halves. <laughs> I, I still think that somehow I, both the theorem and this argument are kind of slightly magical, but uh, I, I know, I, we haven't found a mistake in the proof. If you were a referee on the paper, would you accept it? The what? If you were a referee on such a paper, would you accept it? I, 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 would, have, I would have serious <laughs> doubts. <laughs> uh, I think I'm, oh, okay, here's, uh, since I never seem to run out of time, it's like the <laughs> miracle of the fishes and the loaves. And, uh, 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 so here's, uh, I think this is the, uh, yes, it's probably the last uh, slide, except, except, except for the thank you one. <laughs> the, uh, so theorem, uh, yeah, so theor theorem B is the, uh, is the, um, is that theorem that says without any uniformity on the Gaussian falloff, you still get the limiting thing having the uh, 
having the fall off. The key to it is you obviously you have to use the zeros property because uh, you must use something. And uh, whoops. Uh, and uh, th there's <laughs> uh, well, this isn't proof. This is the key to the proof. <laughs> Uh, the uh, so the, so there's a kind of uh, there's a Hadamard factorization you know it's like like writing a polynomial as a product over zeros for entire functions and you have enough uh, uh, conditions on the on this function about the uh, exponential you know entire function of type two or something like that so uh, and it's even other things so you have a, a nice uh, representation over the product of the zeros. The zeros here are plus or minus i y sub k. Those are the pure imaginary zeros. They have to come in pairs by realness or, or evenness or something or other. And so you get this uh, infinite product representation where these, these zeros have to, uh, have to go to infinity fast enough so that the sum 1 over y squared is finite. And then there's a relation between the uh, the second moment of this random variable, of course, that, that's, you know, it's a moment generating function, so it's a Taylor coefficient, and then that's related to, uh, to these location of the zeros this way. And somehow, if you use that factorization in the right way, just having the weak convergence, first, first you use it to tell you that the second moments are uniformly bounded. Once you have the second moments uniformly bounded because of this, Relationship that tells you something about uh, the zeros altogether, and then you th then you you use that and you know, some some. I've always regarded complex variable theory as black magic, and so you use a little black magic. Uh, and, and okay, so that that's a, that's a comment about that proof, and then. Uh, so re remember, I, I said that that old paper of mine, uh, the way I I, I showed. The result for the, the thing you're interested in for the zeta function was I actually characterized all perfect f's. So the, the besides the besides the um, um, besides the easing measure uh, spin my half measure delta one plus delta minus one uh, and and the uh, the five the fourth kind of measure like this it turns out that in a sense all of them are sort of perturbations of the Phi to the fourth measure, and so sort of have this representation, and it's not hard to, to see that uh, that the um, the capital phi function is not of this is not of this form. It doesn't have the right growth properties, basically, and so that's why that 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 is a corollary that gave that that capital lambda was strictly greater than minus infinity. Okay, uh, so let me let me end by. Uh, uh, again, wishing happy birthday and thanking the uh, organizers.